told today, I'm going to read a few stories from my book. This book is called Inspirational Stories. I have 10 chapters, 64 stories, and about 23 illustrations. Each chapter has a theme. And in the first chapter, is called Stop and Ponder Life's Meaning. So the first story, it's actually a Christian story because um, it's often spoken as one of the main stories in the Christian theology to give light on where we went wrong. So in one sense there's no contradiction between Christianity and the Vedas because um, the message is uh, The underlining message is to love God with all thy heart. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom will come. So there's no contradiction. It is the same philosophy that we preach. The Christians don't believe in the Big Bang and neither do we. Such a hypocritical piece of information that's being sent out to everyone, the masses of people. There was nothing, then there was a Big Bang, and then suddenly there was everything. And everyone believes it. without exception. Except for those who have a little inclination <coughs> of devotional service to God and believe there is a God and He's our eternal Father. So there was once the son of a rich man He was a little materialistic. Not a little, he was a lot. And one of the things he liked doing was to drive his car very fast. It was an addiction for him. And one day he was up in the mountains, like you have here, nice mountains. So he went up to the mountains and he was speeding around. And then at one point he lost control. The bad news is that the car went hurtling hundreds of feet down the cliff and exploded at the bottom. The good news is that the driver, the son of the rich man, he managed to jump out of the car and he uh, landed on some sand dunes. This is a picture. So even though that's good news, but when he landed, he bumped his head. And because of that, he suddenly went into an amnesia condition. And you can try to imagine yourself how he felt because he had forgotten who he was. He didn't know where he was. 
didn't know anything about his address or family members. He just had forgotten everything. He was just sitting there for a long time. And then some tribesmen in the valley, they saw him and they also studied him and they could understand that he had lost his memory. So they approached him and took him to their village. They gave him a new name and they gave him a new identity. He became the local carpenter of the village. His father, well, he said and didn't return, so he was very concerned. Where is my son? So he went out looking for him and it took him some time to find him. But when he found him, he came running up, my son, my son. And the son looked at the father and said, who are you? I've never seen you before. So then the father understood, oh, my son is in an amnesia condition. So he went back to the town and hired a physician to come back and give his son some shock treatments shock therapy. And after some time, he uh, regained his memory and recognized his father. And then they went back home together. Aivo. <laughs> Got a good ending. Well, the question is, do we have a good ending ourselves? Because in the same light, we're sons of the richest personality in existence, Lord Sri Krishna. He, he is the owner of everything. We try to claim proprietorship over land and property. But unless we invite Krishna then we're actually stealing from the Lord, using it for, for something which is not included in his purpose of our life. So therefore, there's karmic reactions to practically everything we do. So when we looked at Krishna one day, and we thought, eh, why does he always have to be God? I'd like to take that position. I want people to serve me. And Krishna doesn't interfere with our little independence. He's actually given us that independence so that we can choose. We don't, he's not forcing us to serve him. But when we choose, when we make that choice of taking turning our backs on Krishna. And from that moment on, we make our descent to the material world. And it's a long way down. And when we landed, we bumped our heads, and we are now experiencing spiritual amnesia. We've forgotten our eternal father, all our playmates in the spiritual world. We've forgotten the spiritual world itself. We've forgotten Krishna. <coughs> and we get given a new name. My name was David. David all kinds of funny names. Svetlana. <laughs> and we get given some kind of occupation. 
doctor, politician, scientist. And it goes on and on and on. The wheel of samsara, birth, death, 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 birth, death. And why not some more birth, death? In this way we've been rotating who knows how long. We celebrate our birthday. I am 21 years old today. I am 54 years old today. I am 77 years old today. People chant the happy birthday prayer to us. And it feels so nice. We blow out the candles. And we have a little party. But my question is... Are we 21, 54, 77? More like a million years old today. And perhaps to say that you're a million years old may be very kind. Could be more. Are we going to celebrate? You want to blow out a million candles? Have a party. Yes, yeah, it's, it's funny, isn't it, when you talk about it and you actually bring in contents the real picture. So all this, you know, 21, 34, 77, 50, it's a big illusion. However, there's one good thing about this material world which uh, we can be thankful of. And that is that there's plenty of shock therapy. Plenty. And those shock therapies get worse and worse more and more intense. That is the nature of the material world. It has to get more and more intense. Prabhupada said you're supposed to suffer here. If you didn't, you would not want to go back home and think everything's fine. Norway is a little bit like that. How many Norwegians are here today? Two. Three. Well, we cannot count you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a Vaikuntha man. <laughs> you too. I don't know you, but you look quite Vaikuntha like anyway. <laughs> but where are the Norwegians? There's <laughs> Lithuanians, there's the Indians. No, they don't want to come here because this is for the people that are failures. They don't have any money. They wear these robes and they don't even know how to cut their hair properly. <laughs> anyway, we're okay. We got our oil. We got our, we're rich in a rich country. Yeah, we don't need Krishna. But anyway, the suffering is still there. And the shock therapy is uh, reg regulated in such a fashion that there's nothing you can do about it. <coughs> well, there is something we can do. We can rationalize. Let's, let me do some drama here. I, I really like to have a microphone when I'm doing this because it's better. 
But anyway, I'm from England and we love drama, so please excuse me for... <laughs> so this is shock therapy number one. It's okay, it's not so bad, but it, it did hurt, okay, so let me see. That's life. Sometimes up, sometimes down. Nothing to worry about. Shock therapy number two. That's it, chance. Could have happened to anyone, but it happened to me. Nothing to worry about. And then one day you get a double booster. done to deserve this? Aha. Uh -huh. Question number one. What did I do to deserve this? Now we're getting somewhere. Because the super soul, when he hears that, he's thinking, this person is ripe and ready. We're acknowledging that we're suffering because we have done something wrong. And therefore the super soul then starts to take interest. Otherwise he just lets you carry on. That's his... He doesn't interfere. If he watches, in the Gita there's a picture, two birds si sitting in the tree. One is eating the fruits, the other is just watching. So the soul is the one eating the fruits and the super soul is simply watching, witnessing the activities of the soul. But when we actually start inquiring, the super soul takes some personal interest in us. Hmm. Okay, let me arrange something for this soul. And so one night, you know, you're going down the road and you're Let's say you're going to the discotheque. The discotheque is on the right side, but you suddenly turn left and you don't can't figure out how that happened. And then suddenly a, a devotee jumps out from the bushes and gives you a bag of Gita. <laughs> What's this? Well, sir, um, it's called the bag of the Gita. Bag of a Gita? What is that all about? Well, you'd be interested in this, sir, because it, right in the second chapter, Krishna doesn't really waste any time at all and tells us something which is relatively, not relatively, most important. That we're not this body, we're a spirit soul. Okay. That sounds interesting. Here's a donation. 
It's like the book. Home. You may even put it on the shelf. But it doesn't matter. The book is non different than Krishna. He puts it on the shelf. And the, the Bhagavad Gita is illuminating your home. Although you don't know it. And it's just a matter of time. One day you pick it up and you start reading. That is why we are doing what we are doing. We are engaged in devotional service so that we can regain our dormant remembrance and love of, of Krishna. And Krishna, we see uh, practically how Krishna is reciprocating with us. I've been practicing for 50 years. What do you think? What do you think? Uh, yeah. yeah, you look at me. What do you, what do you see? You're not connected to this physical reason closer to Krishna than everyone else. <coughs> You said it. I didn't. What else do you see? It could be because of the higher taste that takes you this way. Yeah. It took some time, but the process works. And you give up the lower taste because you get a higher taste. So what does that mean? Uh, accepting the higher taste, wh what do you get? You get a lot of peace? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of peace and satisfaction and freedom. You have almost like one foot in the spiritual world. You have to have one foot here because we're here and the body is here and we need to stay in the body. <laughs> but Prabhupada said that the consciousness uh, is a Vaikuntha one. When you take to the process of bhakti, then uh, one doesn't live in this world, one lives in the spiritual world. And because of this is because of Krishna's reciprocation with us. He sees our sincerity of purpose and he comes and uh, he can personally guide us, he can personally protect us and he will give us knowledge, detachment, renunciation. All these are part of the package of bhakti. We don't have to strive separately for, that, for any of these things. It's given to you automatically. And then our objective is to remember Krishna at the time of death. So we don't fear death like others fear. Others are very bewildered about the last moment of life. Where will I go? What? what will happen. We know, we know our destination. And Krishna says if you worship the demigods, you go to the planet of the demigods. If you worship me, you will come to me. If you remain a materialist, you will have to come back to this world and live another life according to your desire.
although I said there's no contradiction between the Krishna conscious way of life and the Christian way of life. But I have to mention, though, that there is some differences, and that is, if you inquire from a Christian who is God, he will not be able to tell you. What does he look like? I don't know. What is his address? Well, I don't know. Heaven, maybe. They say the goal is paradise. Paradise is heaven. And the Muslims, too. That is their goal, paradise. Better place than this. Well, they have no conception of the eternal life in the spiritual world. No conception that there's a difference between the two. So in the cover of my book, I have two trees. This tree is the tree of the spiritual world and there is a devotee picking the fruits of the tree of the spiritual world. And this tree is next to a river which has a reflection of the spiritual tree, a perverted reflection, where someone's trying to pick the fruits of the tree in the water, but they are illusory. Unless you have information about the spiritual world, then you're still living in the material world. You have no other, no other conception about this wor world. So that's why the Krishna conscious philosophy it even goes beyond beyond the Hindu philosophy, the Hindu Vedas. The Vedas mainly deal with the free modes of material nature. But Krishna says, rise above these modes and be transcendental. So although the Puranas and the Upanishads and all these other pieces of literature are a means to get to a higher goal, it's only the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam Mahabharata, Ramayana, these, these literatures, these are the essence of the Vedas. And therefore, um, we don't necessarily have to, we don't have to worship all the demigods. There are 33 million demigods. But the problem is that um, You worship the demigods, they will give you what you want. But if you worship Krishna, he'll only give you what you need. I remember when I first went to India in 1973, because Prabhupada wanted some of his disciples to go to India, and I was thinking, well, anything's better than being in London. <laughs> So I went to India, but I got a big surprise because I was thinking, ah, oh, easy preaching in India. Everyone loves Krishna. Everyone knows Krishna and loves him. One day, a sannyasi was giving a class one evening, and it was a wonderful class. It was it was a funny class too. It was very jokey. I was in fits. I was actually in fits. I was almost rolling on the floor in laughter. Because <laughs> he presented the philosophy in such a wonderful way. But after his class, one in Hindu man stood up. And he was really upset. He said, why? Why all this Krishna? Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. 
Why not Durga? Why not Shiva? Why not Ganesh? It was a real big challenge. And I was wondering, what is he going to say to this guy? <laughs> <laughs> and I was really surprised what he said. It was really, really well spoken. He said, if all the if all the gods are the same, then why are you excluding Krishna? He said, no, you will not worship Krishna because Krishna is Hari. And Hari is the one who takes things away from you. And the man He didn't know what to say. <laughs> he, was, he just sat back in his seat and that was it. <laughs> it was very powerful and it's true. If you ask for anything from the demigods, they'll give it to you, no, no qualms. But the problem is what they give you is, is going to keep you in the material world. I was giving an, uh, giving an example yesterday in the class <coughs> that we're in a prison house. This material world is a prison house. We don't see it's a prison house. We think this is reality, but it's actually a prison house. We're here to be, to be punished and reformed. Just like in the material prison house, you know, the, you have the university, but you also have a prison house, so you can choose which one you want to attend. Well, let's say you did something wrong and you went to prison. And one day the warden of the prison, he came to see you, he tapped on the cell door he said, my dear prisoner, today I'm feeling, I'm feeling um, charitably, charitably disposed. You can ask me anything you want. And the prisoner is like shocked. Wow, you mean anything I want? Yeah. Just name your price and I'll give it to you. So he's thinking, hmm, anything I want. So he's looking around his cell and he says, ah, can you get me another bed? I mean, this one here is a little bit too hard. I need something softer. And the warden says, is that all you want? Yeah, give me a bed, I'll be okay. <laughs> this is the illusion of this world. We want to be here. We want to be here and enjoy the fruit. Well, the problem is that they're illusory. They're not, they may not be illusory. They may be real to some extent, but they're temporary and they cause a lot of suffering. You see, you see it in the rich people, the rich and the famous. I mean, they're not happy. They make glossy magazines to make them look like they're happy. But in reality, they're all suffering. Because money is not the honey. Krishna, he's different. He he knows, he knows what you need. He he knows that you got to get out of this world. He's actually very merciful. He wants us back more than we want to go back. So 
In London, we have our temple of Soho Street. Anyone that's been there for our temple? No? Yeah. Right in the heart of London, right in the heart of Maya's kingdom. And there's a magazine in London called Time Out. And one in one issue in Time Out, there was a They do reviews on different places in London where you can go. I said, if you want to go to a good vegetarian restaurant, go to Govinda's. It has the best food in London. And if you want a new pair of shoes, go upstairs to the temple. It was kind of a little bit of a joke because <laughs> we leave our shoes <laughs> outside the temple. Well, we don't here, but usually. For us, it's not a joke, you know. Many devotees, when they come to the, for the first time to the temple, they have a good time. But when they go to the cloakroom and look for their shoes, suddenly they disappeared. <laughs> Where's my new suede shoes? <laughs> When Krishna knows you're going to be a devotee and he just starts to take things away you don't need. The <laughs> <laughs> Prophet said the only lacking in this world is the lack of Krishna consciousness. When you have Krishna consciousness you have everything. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. In between the stories we can chant. Hare Krishna. Hare, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. Once a monkey, he was doing like monkeys usually do, jumping from tree to tree. And one crocodile came downstream. He saw the monkey. He called up to the monkey, Hey monkey, you want to come for a ride on my back? The monkey was thinking, wow. Hmm. A ride on a crocodile's back. I never did that before. I said, okay, I'm coming. He climbed down, jumped on the crocodile's back, and the crocodile turned around and went back upstream. 
after some time, the monkey said, by the way, crocodile, where are we going? And the crocodile said, I'm taking, to, I'm taking you to my wife so that she can eat your heart. So what did the monkey say? He left his heart in the museum. Yeah. Oh, can we go back? I left my heart in the tree. So the crocodile turned back and went back to the tree. Monkey jumped up onto the top branch and looked down to the crocodile and said, Bye bye, crocodile. <laughs> what does this story mean? It means that we've got to learn to say no. Society is, you know, expert in telling us what we should eat, drink, and wear. I sometimes look at the jeans that have rips in the knees and, and think, you know, how, how dare they say that this is a fashion when, you know, just use some common sense. You know, they're just teaching you. There's no common sense. Common sense has been kicked out of the window. Nothing here anymore. That's common sense. And people accept it. So we have to learn to say no. Say no. When Prabhupada came to the West, he was told by some Indian yogi swamis who are in New York, now you've come to New York, you need to conform to the Western ways. He said, eat with a knife and fork, you need to give up your vegetarian strict diet, you need to, what else is it? Yes. Put on some pants. Prabhupada said, I have not come here to beg anything. I have come here to give. I will not I will not conform to your ways. Others may conform because they're coming to beg something from the West. I am I'm not begging anything. I'm giving. But he said, no, 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 no. When the, when the moon landing was on the television, Prabhupada was watching it with the disciples. And all the disciples were very excited, oh, moon landing. And then suddenly Prabhupada said, they have not landed on the moon. And all the devotees were shocked. But Prabhupada, it's on the television. <laughs> it's being transmitted all over the world. Hundreds and thousands of people are watching. And Prabhupada said again, they have not landed on the moon. He was the first one to say it. Now if you Google moon landing, there's so many hoax theories about the moon landing. Hundreds. People don't believe it anymore. Then they turn their attention to Mars or something else, thinking that they can cheat again. But this is the nature of this world. Hmm? So many lies, lies after lies after lies after lies. But 
But a new ending is the biggest, one of the biggest lies. The carton of juice, it says 100% pure. Well, I'll ask you, is it 100% pure? No. If I was to relabel the carton of juice, I would label it um, 100% rubbish, come and buy. That would be the truth. Mother Earth, she said, I can take any amount of weight. And there's a lot of weight. Uh, water, there's two thirds water on this planet. It's very, very heavy. I can take that. I can take all the skyscrapers you're building too. But there's one thing that I cannot take, and that is all the lies. Mother Earth said that. It's a verse in the Bhagavatam. Sometimes people ask me, okay, what was it about Prabhupada that you liked the most? It's a difficult question to answer because everything Prabhupada did was very special. But when I really think about it, his greatest contribution to this world was that he told the truth. It's like that story, the king came, the king was visited one day by a tailor. The tailor said, my dear king, I would like to make some clothes for you. These clothes would be so special that everyone will appreciate them. If they didn't, if they don't appreciate them, they would be quite foolish because these clothes are going to be so special. So the king was intrigued. He said, "Okay, you make them, and then come back when they're ready." So three months later, he returned. He said to, to the king, "I have brought your new clothes." So he had a box and he handed the box to the king. He said, you go now and change. All the people are waiting for you. They know I'm here. They want to see your new clothes. So the king took the box into his chamber and changed his dress. When he opened the box, there was nothing in there. But he was thinking, well, if I say there's nothing in the box, then he will the word will go around that I'm fool number one. So he took the clothes and he pretended to put them on. And then he paraded in the street. And everyone was, oh, look at the king's new clothes. How wonderful. And they all showered flowers, there was trumpets blowing drums playing. And then amongst the crowd there was one little boy. He suddenly said, The king has no clothes on. And everyone heard. What was that? A child? What a child says, you know, it's never to be taken lightly. Oh, does the king have clothes or not? Hmm. So Prabhupada was like that little boy. He told the world, you have nothing. You have nothing to offer. Nothing. Zero. It's just zero, 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 zero. No matter what you're doing, it may be uh, technologically high, medicinally um, proven, 
this or that. He said, but unless you add Krishna to the zeros, then there is no value. It is just zero, 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 zero. So we are adding Krishna, and when we add Krishna, we see the transformation that's taken in, that's being taken in our life. And because of that transformation, it's real, it's true, it's a fact. We can say no to Maya easily. So I want you to sing this song with me, okay? You would like to sing a song with me? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right, here's the picture of the crocodile and the monkey. <laughs> okay. Say after me. Play a little guitar here. Say no, Say no. To, the devil. to the devil. Say no. Say no. Say no. Say no. Say no. Say no. To the devil. To the devil. Say no. Say no. Say no. Say no. Say yes. Say yes. One time. One time. Yourself. Yourself. Your soul. Your soul. For sure. For sure. It's sure. It's sure. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> this is a song um, one of my god brothers wrote in one of his albums. Say no to the devil. The devil, of course. You, you know the devil is Maya. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. This next story is called Worldly Attachment. There was a um, merchant. What was his name again? Kailash. He was growing grains and um, he was very successful growing and selling. And one day Narada Muni came along and saw Kailash. You know, Narada Muni is a big time preacher. He likes to save the souls of this world. So he came along and he said, uh, Kailash, how would you like to go to Vaikuntha with me? I'm on my way to see Lord Narayan. And if you like, I can take you. So Kailash, you know, thanked Narada Muni. He knew uh, the importance of returning to Narayan at some point. He said, I tell you what, Narada, you know, I have responsibilities right now. I have two children my wife to look after. But come a little later in my life and I will take up your offer. 
turn around and then he okay I'll come back and see you later and one day he did come back and by that time Narada Muni uh, Kailash was you know he was he had gray hairs and his two sons were already grown up they had t they were be they were being trained to take over the business his teeth were popping out so he was right at the the end of life Adam Mooney approached him again. Kailas, now you're a little old and your sons have grown up. I'm offering again your, the opportunity for you to go back home. Well, thank you, Narada. But you know, life is such that I have now two grandsons <laughs> <laughs> and you know they're dependent on me I'm training my sons to take over the business I'm just just not ready yet it's just not it's not it's not the right time and of course Narada Muni he was you know he was a little concerned with Kailash he said look you can die at any time. Why don't you just take this opportunity and come back home? But it didn't matter what he said. Kailash was, was determined to continue. So Narada Muni left. But he returned again. So many years later. And he was looking around for Kailash. He didn't see him anywhere. So he knocked on the farm door. And the sons, one of the sons answered, Oh, where's your father, Kailash? Oh, Narada Muni, how wonderful to see you. Uh, but we have some grave news for you because Kailash had, has already left this world. <laughs> uh, we're, we're sad to be the bearers of such news. I know you like our father, but he's already left. So Narada Muni offered his condolences and said, I'm sorry to hear that. May he be blessed to, to receive an auspicious transition. And as he was walking down the path, one dog was following him and suddenly the dog started speaking. Narada Muni, Ralph, Ralph, I am Kailash, Ralph, Ralph. Narada Muni looked, you're Kailash? What are you doing in the body of a dog? Well, you see, my sons, they're not putting the money in the bank. Ralph, Ralph, I'm protecting the house, so there are no fees. Narada Muni said, look, even in the body of a dog, I can now deliver you. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, Kailash, the dog, he was, he was too attached. No matter what you know, Narada Muni suggested to him, he just couldn't let go. So many, many, many years later, Narada Muni came back again. And he was looking around for the dog. <laughs> he couldn't see the dog anywhere. And he knocked on the door. And that's one of the sons answered again. 
Oh, Gerardo Mooney, very nice to see you again. We're pleasantly surprised that you keep returning. No, I was just passing by, you know, these are nice pasture grounds, and I thought I'd just say how Harry Ball. And, and by the way, last time you had a dog, where, where's that dog? Oh, that dog. Well, that dog, he's already left this world, he's left his body some six months ago. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. Uh, I will be on my way. So he was crossing the fields. And at one point, he heard a sound in amongst the grains. down and there was a snake Kailash you're now a snake will you go from bad to worse come up even in the body of a snake I can deliver you but again Kailash he had all his excuses well, my sons, they're now putting the money in the bank, but they don't get up until 12 midday. And that's really, really too late. And there's a, there's a danger that the elephants will come and eat all the grains. Something like that. Kailash said, okay, Kailash, I'm going to give you one more chance. Come with me now, and I will take you home. so attached so that Narada Muni had an idea clapped his hands three times <laughs> Haribo Haribo and Kailash's sons came running out of the house what's wrong Narada you got a snake in your field Oh, we'll come. We'll get some sticks. Because <laughs> in India, that's the policy. You know, snakes are dangerous. <coughs> Don't let a snake live. They're they're envious and easily can kill children and even adults. So Kailash's sons, they came with the sticks. And they started beating, beating. And Kailas, the snake, he tried to communicate. I am your son. I am your father, Kailas. And as much as he hissed, the more of the sons beat him until he was dead. Oh. 
And there's a nice end to the story. Because Kailas died in front of Narada Muni, who was a pure devotee, he was able to take his next birth in a pious situation. He even remembered his previous birth. And he became a devotee and perfected his life and went back home, back to Gauri. Hari Bol. Hari Bol. But it's a good story. It's, it's instructive for all of us because the world is such that we can easily become attached to the things around us. But we've got to detach ourselves from the picture. <coughs> By the way, a 13 year old girl did these illustrations. Any questions you'd like to ask? Difficult it to? It to come again to the to the test. Mm. Because it is a pity, I'll say, I'll give the example of my own, that it is a pity that you see that you get so much peace and still you are not putting that much effort. You still again and again. Mm. Yeah. Yes, one time a devotee said to Prabhupada, this, this world is I forget what it was he said. This world is terrible or horrible or I can't remember the word he used, but Prabhupada said no, no, no. No, this world is beautiful. You know, the trees, the ocean, the sunset. You have not seen how beautiful this world is. There's so many things in this world that, is, that are beautiful. And there has to be some beauty here. Because otherwise we'd very easily get out of here. Why should we stay? Of course, you know, the beauty is declining more and more, and everyone's becoming aware of it. But we still can't say it's not beautiful. There are things which are just so, so uh, attractive that we cannot part from it. And then he said, but even so, even though the world is, has its beauty, the problem is that it's temporary. Whatever we're attached to, it's a, a temporary, you know, facet of life. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. That's the problem, it's no. We may cling on to things, but sooner or later they're taken away. And to the degree to the degree we're attached, to that degree we suffer. <coughs> Therefore, um, the practices of a Krishna consciousness are there for us so that through the practices, we can 
access the art of detachment. We don't have to separately um, learn how to be detached because bhakti is such that it's part of the parcel. Knowledge and det detachment are all connected to bhakti. So in that sense, um, if we continue with the process, you know, no matter how difficult it is, there's guarantee, there's, there's every guarantee of success. And I'm, you know, you could say I'm a living example of that because I was a hippie. You know, hippies, we, we were enjoyers. <laughs> we did everything that you shouldn't do. But Bhakti has worked on us. Robert said that Lord Chaitanya's movement is to first deliver the most fallen. So we hippies were the most fallen. <laughs> so just to test the ground, <laughs> so to speak, we were delivered first. And if I can be uh, delivered and come up to a higher levels of consciousness, I don't think it would be any problem for anyone else. So you just got to push on. One time, even Jamuna said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you know, your, your male disciples, they will very easily go back home, back to Godhead. But we are women. We, we are women, and um, the chances are not as great. So Prabhupada said, yes, that's true, if you think you're a woman. <laughs> He said, but you're not a woman, you're a Vaishnavi. He said, woman is doing all this. <laughs> you're doing this. So, our saving grace is the holy name, the association of devotees, the holy dham. You have been to Vrindavan? You have been? So, you know, these are our saving graces. And if, if we just catch hold of them, And once a uh, devotee asked Prabhupada, can you give me the mercy to read your books? Prabhupada said, well, I've printed the books. I've translated the books. Now it's up to you to read them. You know? And he gave the analogy, someone's fallen in the well. Help, help. Someone comes along. Oh, what? Oh, you're down in the well? Well, I'll get a rope. He gets a rope and passes it down. And the man in the well says, well, could you please give me the mercy to hold on to the rope and you can pull me out? And I've given, I given you the rope, that is my mercy. Now you grab hold of it. And the mercy is there, but due to, you know, 
lack of Krishna consciousness or whatever, we are still not grabbing home. And that's the problem. It's not the deficiency. It's not on the part of deficiency of Krishna consciousness to deliver us, but it's on the part of us to not take it seriously enough and get diverted with the things of this world. So therefore, it's not a quick process. It's a very slow, laborious process. But if you're, Prabhupada said, one devotee said, if you're sincere, then it's okay, right, Prophet? Prophet said, well, not just sincere. Sincerity is one thing, yes, but spiritual intelligence is another. You need spiritual intelligence, and spiritual intelligence is given to you by Krishna. So spiritual intelligence is very important because it allows you to distinguish reality from illusion. So you can check yourself and say yes or no. And by Rabbi Goswami has mentioned this too, that we accept things favorable for devotional service and reject things which are unfavorable. This is our, this is our gauge. We ask, well, is this favorable or is it not? If it's not, we reject it. Is that okay? Anything else? Yes. Maharaj, what is the proper way to um, train up children in Krishna consciousness to increase their interest in Krishna? First, to be example yourself. If you watch television, they will watch television. <laughs> if you don't chant your rounds, they will not chant. But the other thing is, you know, sometimes um, we get this wrong idea about giving Krishna consciousness to children. I was giving a Grihasta seminar in Russia some years ago and uh, we were talking about raising children in Krishna consciousness. And one male devotee said, he said, every morning I put my son in a cold bath. I said, what? Yeah, cold bath. I said, what? Does he cry? Oh, yeah, he cries. So why you put him in a cold bath then? Well, just so that he'll make some spiritual advancement. So I got up and I pinned him against the wall and said, don't do that again. For the good of the child and for the good of the child remaining Krishna conscious. You cannot do that. You cannot, Prabhupada said you should not force Krishna consciousness on the children. You set the house, um, you make the house spiritually charged and that will help the children. Maybe later on if they wish to, they may like to follow their parents and chant but they should make the choice, not you. My son, he's 28 years old now. He just got married to another devotee. He's a disciple of Radhanath Swami. Chants 16 rounds every day. And as a child, we never, as parents, we never, we never told him that you have to chant. Rather, he wanted. He, what? What is this you do? You know, and, ah, it's not for you. you know, you're just a child. But he wanted to do. It. 
So he did it for some time. He was chanting with us. Then, of course, teenage, teenage, er, uh, age, at teenage, he stopped. It's a very vulnerable time for children. What to do? Do I, you know, shall I or shall I? And I just be, I was just his friend. This is the Indian policy, actually, a Vedic policy that when a, a child reaches, I think it's 14 or 16, you should change the relationship from parent to friend. And, you know, our son, he, he did most of his education, well, his first eight years in, at home. We homeschooled him, and the rest he did in Mayapur. So his mother was there with him. So he had a, he had a very good, solid foundation. So I wasn't really worried about him at all. I knew he was very grounded. I'm sure enough, he he took initiation. He's got another. He's got a wife, a, a devotee, good standing. So there's nothing about Krishna consciousness that I forced on him. Does that answer your question? If the child is naughty, Prabhupada, you should show the stick, but don't use it. Could you even not make suppose there's this edict, <coughs> as parents, uh, you should not force a kiss and so on. But uh, as parent yourself, when you are doing all, you are into all these things. Because you are into material world. You have your daily routines. You are you know stuck up in all those things. You go to office. You need to go drop the kids, pick up the kids, and so on. How much time, or like, how should you devote <coughs> for this spiritual practice? Well, that's not for me to say. I will, I will say 100%. <laughs> Sannyasis have to say that. <laughs> but I have been a grihasta, so I know, I know what it is to be a grihasta. And I only had one son, and he was enough. <laughs> and he used to come up to me and say, come on, Dad, let's fight. <laughs> I said, well, you always win. <laughs> he was a big boy. Actually, he was, when he was born, he was 10, 10 pounds, 3 ounces. What is your weight here in Norway? Kilos. Kilos, yeah. I don't know how many kilos that is. I think it's about 5 kilos. Yeah. Is that big for a child? 5 mm -hmm. kilos? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was like one year old already when he was born. And um, my wife wanted a home birth, a natural birth, but we had to rush her to the hospital. Anyway, when he was born, um, I held him up. I, I had this idea, I wouldn't say Hare Krishna, I would just say Govinda, so that would be the, the first thing he would hear. So I said, Govinda! And the nurse said, what was his name? <laughs> and she had a tag ready to write his name, so I said, oh, just put Govinda. And that was his name anyway, we, we decided, oh, it's a good name. <laughs> so when I was holding him up saying Govinda, another nurse said, wow, big boy. And I said, yeah, and we're vegetarians. <laughs> she said, you're vegetarians? <laughs> Every opportunity to preach. Anyway, 
answer to your question, um, it's for you to decide. Every household is different. And it's not just about deciding either, it's about the will to, to want to, to do the both sides, the, the uh, spiritual and, and domestic simultaneously. It's easy to say I have no time to chant, but you can find time. So ideally, we should try to do both. If you cannot do both, you know, you have to <coughs> see what you can do, you know, you will, you will know that. But one, is, one thing is sure, that if you chant 16 rounds, then everything about your household life and your work becomes devotional service. Prabhupada said that even if you work in a, in a factory or, yeah, a factory. He said, you have nothing to do with the, the work, the workers. Um, you're doing your service. This is your service to Krishna. You're maintaining your family or devotees. Just like we maintain this place. And it, it, you know, so it's not material. It's, it's a spiritual activity. So a house of grihastas, you know, they need to maintain their household. So it's a spiritual activity. So you have to so decide that yourself, what, what you can and can't do. I know in my own household life, I always chanted 16 rounds, my wife too, my former wife. <laughs> And uh, we did our cooking, we did all the offerings, we chanted in the morning, some, some prayers, did RT. So it is possible, <coughs> but you need the will to do it. Okay? as you said uh, every day you said 16 rounds mm. in, one go. in one go or it can be divided yeah because you know f family life means you you got to work around the children isn't it <laughs> you try to get up as early as possible because then you get, that's one helps you to be one step ahead this is the secret, actually, of chanting your japa, is to be always one step ahead. So our tomorrow starts the day, meaning that the earlier we take rest, the earlier we can get up. <coughs> and if we can chant most of our rounds before the children get up, it's plus points. It's not an easy thing. If I was... <coughs> If I was to um, be asked which is the best ashram out of all the ashrams, I would say the Grihastha ashram is the best one. Why is that? Well, because you got to do everything yourself. You got to get yourself to to bed. You got to get up. You got to. Do your deity worship, your prayers, your chanting, your your offerings, your cooking offerings, <coughs> vulgar purchasing, your maintenance of the family, maintaining materially and spiritually. So it's a it's never a boring moment in the Grihastha ashram. We sannyasis, we give a couple of classes every day and chant at 16 rounds. Easy life. Well, 
easy, easy, easy. You also have to travel, so we're not in one place more than a f three, four days. So you have nothing to be attached to. So it, it can be exciting, but it can also be a challenge. <coughs> I think Prabhupada was, he said one time that he he would do four rounds before taking a meal. And if he hadn't done those four rounds, he would just wouldn't, he wouldn't take. <laughs> so four rounds before breakfast, four rounds before lunch, four rounds before dinner, something like that. I mean. It doesn't really matter when you do it. If you if you're regulated, you can do it at any time. Um, but you have to be careful that you um, don't leave too many to the evening because that's when it starts getting difficult. Okay. I think I have spoken enough. Thank you so much for your patience. Srila Prabhupada Ki, chanting 16 rounds every day Ki, and back home, back to Gaudiya Ki. Anyone want this book, then you even get a picture of me on the back, and I will even sign it. Maybe. Uh, you speak to yeah, I would say hello as well. And Maharaj has a <coughs> Bajan CD if you want to listen him singing when we have CD as well. Where is that? Uh, it's over there. Uh, get in the other side. Uh -huh. This one. Yeah. So, shot him. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.